Hello, and welcome to Skynet Today's Let's Talk AI podcast, where you can hear from AI researchers about what's actually going on with AI and what's just clickbait headlines. We release weekly AI news coverage and also occasional interviews, such as today. And so I'm the host of this interview, Sharon Joe, a fourth year PhD student in the Sanford Machine Learning Group, advised by Andrew Ng, and the host of this episode. In this special interview episode, we'll get to hear from the author of the recent book, Genius Makers, Cade Metz. And Cade is a New York Times reporter covering AI, self-driving cars, robotics, VR, and other emerging areas. And he was previously a senior writer at Wired. His book, Genius Makers, is about the story of AI and the people, the genius makers, behind the AI and making that AI rise and flourish as it has today. Uh, and it's out now, so please go grab a copy. Uh, but it's also received very early praise from Walter Isaacson, who is the best-selling author of Leonardo da Vinci and Steve Jobs, as well as Ashley Vance, the best-selling author of Elon Musk. And just to share a couple of tidbits from those others, uh, they said that the book, quote, puts artificial intelligence into a human perspective and is a, quote, definitive take on how AI technology came to be and what its arrival will mean for us. And I will say personally, I love the humor peppered into the book. Uh, And I spent a few sleepless hours one night flipping through the stories. um, And it's as close to an AI person's gossip column as you can get. So I very, very much encourage you, um, those folks who are into AI or just getting into AI, uh, to pick up a copy. So thank you so much, Cade, for joining me on this episode. I am glad to be here. And I love that you point to the humor in the book, you know, which is mostly not my humor. It's the humor of the characters uh, who I'm describing in this narrative. Um, You know, there's this uh, stereotype that engineers, researchers, scientists are somehow dour and uninteresting. The, you know, that could not be further from the truth as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, just to take one example of Jeff Hinton in, in this in this book, he has an incredible sense of humor. Ian Goodfellow is another one, um, you know, in a completely different way, right? Incredibly um, charming and funny people, in addition to whatever else they may do. On behalf of the AI community, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the pleasure is all mine. I like to laugh. <laughs> Perfect. And yeah, I, I actually have never met Jeffrey Hinton. So reading about him was amazing. I just didn't realize how funny he was either. It just that never occurred to me as an aspect of his personality. And that definitely shone through uh, throughout the entire book. I believe that he his his jokes really spanned uh, all I don't know. I don't know how many pages, but spanned the entire book. And they're uh, so intricate, right? He's one of those people yeah. whose sense of humor is so good. It's just like a half step ahead of you at least. Right? <laughs> and um, uh, he's, a, he's a brilliant person. Um, and, and he's forthright in his humor, right? There, there's some edge to that, that, that humor. Oh, he's yeah. willing to take people on, and I admire that as well. I, I definitely admire that. Uh, and I aspire to, I guess, more than just one aspect of him, which is the brilliant aspects that we know. I also aspire to uh, have as many good jokes. Um, but first, maybe I, I'm curious about uh, background wise. I see you've been covering AI since at least 2011, if not earlier at Wired and also just technology more broadly before that. You've basically seen AI from when it was starting to get its feet and gaining attention. So I imagine there's actually no one as qualified as you to cover the arc of the story. I I really feel like you're like the perfect person. Um, So what's the range of events that you do cover in your book? How did you choose how far back to go? Well, that's kind of you to say what I really do believe is that I I was lucky. I arrived at Wired magazine uh, it was 2011, 2012, right around then. That's right when there was a serious change happening, right? Where this idea of a neural network was really starting to bear fruit. And when I arrived at Wired, I essentially started a new you know, sub-publication there um, on its website, and along with a guy named Bob McMillan, who's now at the Wall Street Journal, and who's one of my favorite people and and favorite reporters. And what we aimed to do was to find the places in the industry where there was real change. And that was where there was real change. 
Um, it was right at this moment, 2012, when Jeff Hinton and two of his students really sort of demonstrated this change with a paper that's now known as AlexNet, right? right. Um, where uh, the neural network, which is an idea that dates back to the 50s and before, um, it really started to come to come to a head and really started to work in ways that that most of the world did not think it would ever work, right? So that eventually became the book, right? It was my beat. It still is my beat now that I'm at the Times. Is I, I cover that area. I cover other things, but I really cover this hard because there's so much change. And that's the central um, you know, idea in the book, is that this one idea, which dates back so many decades, um, and that most people did not believe in over the many decades that followed, suddenly started to work. And, you know, and then on top of that, what I'm always fascinated by, and this is, this is the kernel of many great stories, you have people like Jeff Hinton, who regardless of what anyone around them thought, they were determined to work on this idea. And there were some moments, including the moment when Jeff first embraced it in 1971 as a graduate student, when no one believed in it, right? That was like the nadir of this idea when he, when he first said, okay, this is what I'm going to work on. That's fascinating to me. And there's a real tension there. And hopefully that, that comes through in the book. We still have that tension, right? People who don't believe in this idea, regardless of what it might do, uh, and um, where there's tension, there's a good story. Let me tell you that. <laughs> that is fantastic. And I, and I think he was also in, and then you mentioned this, a culture, he was in the UK, right? In a culture where it was less okay to have a, a different idea. Um, Absolutely. You sort of see that not only in academia, but in any profession. Like I think about this in my own profession. There, it's hard to stick your neck out and do a story that no one else is doing, right? It's easy to do a story that everyone else is doing, that everyone is on board with. And that's easy. The harder part is to go your own way, uh, whether you're an AI researcher or a journalist. That was certainly the case in the UK. It's fascinating that, that Jeff graduates from the University of Edinburgh in the late seventies, he can't find a job. I mean, literally he cannot find a job because he works on neural networks. Um, he's got to go abroad and he ends up finding this tiny group of people in San Diego in another, on another continent, um, who are on board with this. Um, and that's why he moves to the United States. And I found that really interesting, actually the different cultures from the different, uh, different countries where in the UK it is much less tolerated than science to be a little bit divergent. Whereas in the U S since it was just one, the fact that it's larger and there are just more people, but it also felt like it was more tolerant of, you know, wild, crazy fringe uh, ideas and exploring those as well. You're right. And this is interesting with so many other countries as well. And it's a real theme in the book yeah. that um, you really see these pockets of research pop up in certain places. And uh, again, often driven by the research and the personalities of individuals. So Jeff, he goes from San Diego to Carnegie Mellon. He gets a job at Carnegie Mellon in the 80s. And there comes a point, even as his research uh, gets more and more successful, that he and his wife decide to leave the country because he doesn't want to take research money from Ronald Reagan's Department of Defense. And he knows that is the only way to get funding for AI. It's right at the height of the Iran-Contra affair, which people may remember. And he and his wife, I mean, make a decision to move to Canada and he takes a job at the University of Toronto. And that ends up having this knock-on effect decades later because that becomes the center of gravity for that type of research. Um, up, you know, in Canada, University of Montreal was another place around a guy named uh, Joshua Bengio. You have other centers in Europe, um, but in the U.S., there weren't a lot of people working on this when it finally hit, right? Jan LeCun at NYU was an exception. Right. And uh, I feel like that is the first inkling of ethics kind of seeping into uh, AI. And that, that was definitely a precedent or a decision that Jeff made that may have 
impacted how the field thinks through ethics and it interacts with the government uh, more broadly, as we see throughout the book, with, especially when corporations get involved and there's a lot of money at stake. It's true. It's funny how history repeats itself. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the fascinating yeah. thing about this book is like you see the same situations over and over and over again, with, whether it's ethics or you know, overhype in AI, um, you know, the list goes on. Well, we start with underhype, right? <laughs> right? Exactly. exactly. Um, and so what's what's the range of events that you cover in the book? And how did you um, basically how did you choose your opening? Like your opening was about an auction and it was very tense. Um, I felt like I couldn't stop turning the page because I wanted to know how high that number would go. And I felt like I was in Jeff's shoes. Uh, but how did you choose that as your opening hook? I'm, I'm curious. Well, I'm glad you felt that way when you're reading it, because I've certainly felt that way as I was reporting that. It was it was one of the most interesting things I've ever reported because it's a story. It's about something that everyone thinks they know about, or at least everyone in the AI field, right? The AlexNet paper, everyone acknowledges that's an inflection point in the field, right? That's when neural networks really hit and started to work. Yes. What they don't know is that Jeff and his two students, who were the three people behind the paper, decided to auction themselves off to the highest bidder, which is like a fascinating thing in and of itself. And, and I've yet to find a real precedent for that, um, or even, you know, an example since where that has happened. And it, it kind of goes against Jeff's personality, which is interesting. Um, but what I've been saying to people is that lots of times you start a story, uh, say at the New York Times or, you, or, uh, or with a book, certainly, you, where you can't decide how to begin. In this case, there was, there was no question how it was going to begin. Like it had to begin with that scene um, because – there's so much tension there. There's drama. There's such personality, um, you know, mostly centered around around Jeff. Um, and also, it's shocking how it encapsulates everything that would happen, meaning all the players, all the big players, and we're talking about some of the biggest companies on earth, are there. Um, and it's not just American companies, it's a Chinese giant who's there as well. And that's what I think really going to surprise a lot of people. People think that China has really followed here. They were there from the beginning. Yeah. And so it, it was it was so easy to begin that way. And I'm glad that you felt that tension as you read it. Those last two points, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what I thought. I did not realize China was in the game or Baidu was in the game that early. I really thought they followed and they did not follow at all. They've at been all. talking the whole time. And that was hugely illuminating. I, I actually, I had no clue about the auction as well. Uh, and the, the, and to me, it, everything felt a little familiar to, you know, with Tahoe there and just, <laughs> uh, just, and I know some of the people, so it's just, wow, it just felt so, <laughs> it felt very interesting. Um, and so you, uh, so we've been talking about Jeffrey Hinton for uh, quite some time. Who are some of the other key figures or in individuals that you felt like needed to be highlighted? And how did you make your decision around, around those people? You know, again, in a way, they chose themselves, right? My, my central I idea is that you know, I wanted to follow the way that, that neural networks have changed things, because that's been the really big change over the past 10 years. We know whatever you think about what a neural network may do in the future, there are real changes um, that have happened because of that single idea. So once that was the thread to the book, um, it, it's, it was so interesting how as I reported it, all this would fall into place. Um, it's an amazingly small community, right? The yeah. community that was around this idea, smaller than, than even I think many in the field may may realize in that, you know, one of the most amazing moments was when I realized that the Gatsby unit, which is this, this neuroscience slash machine learning group at the at University College London, which um, was one of the places uh, that gave rise to Demis Asabas and Shane Legg, who founded DeepMind, which is this incredibly important lab that will uh, come into the story as well. The Gatsby unit was founded by Jeff Hinton, right? There's a through line there that is amazing where like 
there's just a, this center of gravity around Hinton and so many of these very important thinkers. And a lot of them think very differently than Jeff, but they have this connection to it. Um, and that's what I found fascinating, whether it's Jan LeCun, who met Jeff in, in Paris in the 80s, and there's this great scene where they first meet and the two of them don't even speak the same language, but they feel like they do because they share this interest in neural networks, um, to Demis and Shane. Um, uh, it, I, I just love following those threads, and I followed them as a reporter. And so my hope was that I could get that on the page and help other people see you know, all the threads that, that weave these people in this story together. Yes. And it definitely felt like a small world and that everyone knew everyone else. And that's how things spread. For example, the, there's also that scene on, I think the private jet where Elon Musk happens to be talking about deep mind. And that's how Larry Page finds out, you know, and I just thought, Oh, of course these people know each other and talk to each other and talk about all of this. And then, uh, Sebastian Thrun, in, uh, you know, introduces Andrew Ng to Larry Page and that a ton of things happen unfold there. Um, and just, they just all know each other. That really strikes me. <laughs> I agree. And right. And then of course, you know, there's, you know, Andrew Ng and, you know, is connected to Hinton in his own way. And, um, you know, we talked about, you know, most of the talent or the people who are interested in this idea not being in the U.S. Andrew was another exception, right? And he saw what was happening with Jeff um, in Canada with with this idea and asked to join this research group um, that, that Jeff had put together uh, north of the border. And um, that's another interesting thread how I love how Jeff is – is moving into one part of Google and Andrew is moving into another part of Google, right? With this same basic idea um, at the, exactly the same moment, right? That was, this was just the moment when this idea for various reasons started to work. Um, and, and then these companies uh, are really embracing it um, because they see it working and, and it's different parts of the companies embracing it. Right, right, right. Some some parts of the company, like search at Google, did not embrace it immediately. Uh, but I, I would say embrace might also be an understatement, given how hard <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg seemed to have fought for yeah. people. Um, yeah, desperately grasped at, uh, at, at some of these individuals or companies uh, that they could acquire or buy uh, in, in, in some way. Well, before you go on, I think that's another interesting point that you bring up is that, that, that Silicon Valley is this constant arms race that you, you know, one company will see another company doing something and then they've got to do the same thing. And they're so worried about being left behind um, that it's astonishing sometimes how quickly these giant companies will just throw money at something because everyone else is, um, in part at least. Just a little bit of that. <laughs> I will say I'm actually impressed with uh, Microsoft in following suit eventually. Uh, but it, it, there definitely is a fear of getting left behind because if you miss the next wave, you might die. You might become a Yahoo, right? And you might not be able to, to change quickly enough. Um, and someone else might be able to have a 10 X thousand X solution. Um, and your, your whole business model is crushed. So that's a good point. And that's one of the reasons I'm so fascinated by the story of Chi Lu and his, his thread in the, in, in the book, you know, where he's trying to get Microsoft to change its ways. Right. And he's got this extreme way he's going to do it. And, you know, and, uh, that, that is an amazing story as well. And, I love how these companies assume their own personalities, you know, and you don't quite, um, you aren't quite sure how all that happens, but it does. And then once the company has its personality, how do you change it? It becomes very, very difficult. It does. But I think some of these companies have found their own stride in integrating AI with, within, with their personality as they move forward. But it is, I think there is that kind of struggle there, right? Like how do I fit AI with the culture of my company uh, and in moving forward? Yes. Um, 
especially at Microsoft with, you know, Azure and like working with the government a lot, I think was very consistent with, with yeah. themselves. <laughs> true, true, true. Uh, and who did you interview directly? Uh, and how, how did you make those, like that kind of decision as you wrote the book? Well, I mean, partly I, I need to be careful about what I say because a lot okay. of people spoke on background. Um, uh, but, you know, a lot of people spoke on the record. You can see in the book in some places where people who were on the record, they're, they're directly quoted in the present tense. So you can see that I talked to them. But there are a lot of people who aren't directly quoted who are on the record. A lot of people um, were on background. Um, you know, my model for this, you know, is it, uh, Bob Woodward and uh, Carl Bernstein wrote this book called The Final Days about Richard Nixon. And, and that's sort of the model they use where you try to talk to everybody and you try to talk to everybody on the record. Some people, for various reasons, need to be on background, but that's it. But what I can say is that almost everyone who is mentioned, um, I shouldn't say that. I talk to I talk to a lot. I just I don't want to like pinpoint who I did and didn't talk yeah, to. No names, no names. <laughs> but um, but I, I I I talk to you know so many of the important players um, in. Uh, in the field. And when it, when it comes down to key facts, like an acquisition price, that kind of thing, I say this in my notes to the book, like that's where you got to be doubly sure. And you got to make sure you've got multiple sources. Mm. Um, so it's that kind of situation. And, um, you know, I, I'm talking to a, a lot of people, rest assured. Right. And I'm sure this is consistent with just journal journalism more broadly uh, as well. But did you notice any discrepancies or inconsistencies uh, as you interview people? And how did you how did you handle those incongruences? And again, you don't have to go into specifics or anything. I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, that's that's hard, particularly with a narrative like this, meaning you want it. You want it to read um, in a way that grabs people's attention and really shows them what's going on. So you can't be constantly sort of stepping back and saying, you know, this person said this and this person said the opposite, right? There are, but there are, you know, two or three moments um, where there's some d discrepancy, um, but those are, aren't moments where it was too hard to decide how to, how to do it. Um, again, you, you try to get multiple people um, to give their opinion and you use that as a way to decide, um, how it should be rendered. Um, there, you know, there are all sorts of places where people are going to read it and they're going to wish I had included X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, you can't include everything, uh, but you try to stay true to the moment, um, and, and as true as you can. It's okay. We can always train an AI model to output the confidence level of each page. Exactly. Um, people need, or line by line if they absolutely need exactly. that. Exactly. Uh, and one thing that I'm curious about, so it's, it's the book is titled Genius Makers and um, I guess subtitle is Mavericks, the Mavericks who brought AI to Google, Facebook and the world. How important were these foundational individuals versus the teams that they brought together? Well, you know this, you work in the field. It's a collaborative process, right? And um, it almost goes without saying that if you are building a technology, you are standing on the shoulders of others. It's just how it works. Um, that said, a book uh, a story is also about showing people uh, who is involved and giving them, you know, a real human sense of what's going on. So naturally, I'm going to make decisions about who I focus on and who I don't. If I focus on one person, that doesn't mean that they are somehow superior uh, to another. Um it means that they are in, an important part of the story, right? right. Um, and uh, so it's not about, you know, trying to decide who in the grand scheme of things is most important. It's 
it's about trying to tell a true story of what has gone on here um, and a coherent story, if that makes sense. Yes. And I think it's safe to say that the funnier you are, the more likely you're going to show up. (laughs) (laughs) Doesn't hurt. Let's just put it that way. It doesn't hurt. Um, That's true. And last question before we get into maybe some spicier questions. Uh, What was particularly surprising for you as you wrote this? Uh, Was there anything that really stood out that kind of, you know, surprised you after having done all these um, all these articles before and having like already knowing the arc of a lot of what's gone on. But as you wrote the book, what what stood out and what maybe surprised you or was unexpected? It's funny. You know, you talked we talked before we uh, started about those those landmines and also how these big things have happened since the book. Um, so that's one of the things we've got running on Monday, right? Um, it's interesting how these stories will play out in the book and then a similar story will play out um, in bigger and bigger ways. So, like people ask me, well, are you worried about your book because this big event has happened? And I say no, because it, it's exactly what happened in the book. It's just with a different company or the problem is even larger now, right? It, it, you can see the trajectory of, of all this stuff. Um, and in some ways it's, it's amazing and it's heartening. In other ways, it's really frightening. Well, maybe this just says inevitably you'll have there a sequel. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. the right. <laughs> You just say, oh, no, I was just waiting for, you know, content for the sequel and – it happened to happen very quickly, very, very quickly, almost immediately after I finished this. No, I, yeah, I don't think it, it's concerning at all for your book because your book goes back so far. And I think that that history is so useful to capture and so useful to bring to life and humanize. I mean, I found it fascinating. Like I said, it was like a gossip column for me. Um, I just wanted to know more because I, I knew some of these people or rather I, uh, I, I know of some yeah. of these people and I just want to learn about their, their lives and how they came to uh, both get to where they are now and also just how they all interacted with each other. What were their personalities? And so that that's really, really fascinating. It's really um, good to hear. And we'll, you know, we'll get to those landmines, but you, you ask about things that surprise me. Yeah, you know, there were there were several. Um, one, and I touched on this a little bit before, is that story about how Chi Lu leaves Microsoft. Um, that was that was shocking and amazing to me, and it, and it shows that there are cases where there are sort of official stories that come out of companies about what happened, and. It might be partly true, but then there's all this other stuff underneath. And I suppose the auction story is similar, right? There's the official story of AlexNet. And then there's this other story beneath it about about these giant companies bidding for the services of these researchers. Those those were certainly surprising moments. Um, And another one we mentioned before is, you know, the connection between Jeff Hinton and Demis Asabas um, and the Gatsby unit uh, in the UK. And, and then the moment when Google acquires DeepMind, the lab started by Demis and, and Shane, that was another surprising moment uh, about how all that happened and how they got Jeff Hinton there, right? The, one of the things we haven't talked about amazingly, and it, because this is the first sentence of the book, is that Jeff Hinton literally does not sit down. And that means he doesn't drive, uh, he doesn't fly because commercial airlines make you sit during takeoff and landing. And that's a great metaphor. And you love it when you stumble onto these great metaphors that are just true, right? He, it's a great metaphor for him and his, his determination um, to make things happen despite the difficulties, right? Uh, he he can't sit down, but he's still going to make it across North America uh, to go 
try to get his idea to work inside the research lab at Microsoft, right? Uh, it's a fascinating thing. And then, you know, that comes out in different ways when Google decides it's going to acquire DeepMind. Uh, these are all surprising moments. And, and this is a, an area that I cover, right, and have covered for many years. Um, I love that the more you dig, uh, the more stuff you're going to find. I mean, it's very telling given his health problems around his back that if he shows up in person, his presence means more than just your average, you know, like star power in a field. It means he really cares about this because it just takes so much strain to actually get him, get his presence there. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Um, so, so it is even more of a signal that maybe you should acquire this company or maybe, maybe is there something important here? Um, and, and that actually uh, gets at another uh, line in the book that really stood out to me that I found was really interesting. And this might get into some spicier questions here is around atheism and how that feels like uh, the religion of choice, so to speak, <laughs> uh, for deep learning scientists. Um, and why do you think that is? Do you think this plays into the kind of U.S.-Canada dynamic by any chance? Um, and I, I also just find it really fascinating. And I guess this also plays into a lot of uh, the political dynamics we may have seen more recently uh, around science and, and religion. Yeah, it's interesting that you pinpoint atheism there and not some of the other things some of the other common denominators, but there is that common denominator. What, the way I think about it, as I continue to mull your question about atheism in particular, is that these are very, many of them are very idealistic people, right? We talked about Jeff Hinton and his approach to Ronald Reagan and the DOD in the 80s. He's got a firm belief on whether or not this technology should be used by the military, right? And that's just one of the ideals that really defines it. You see, you know, you see similar ideals in other people like Yashua Bengio, who we mentioned earlier, who was at the University of Montreal. What's interesting then is that these idealistic people move into these giant companies whose aims in many ways are going to clash with those ideals. And what I found is that that became the book in a lot of ways. When I, when I pitched my book to publishers, that wasn't a big part of it. And that continued to be a bigger and bigger part of it as the book progressed, just because it kept spilling out into the news, right? It kept spilling out into our daily lives. And that really began, became the second half of the book where the, the ideals of these researchers clashed um, with what was going on in the world and what was going on uh, at these companies. Um, the yeah. other really interesting contrast when you talk about religion um, or the re really interesting issue is that this belief in artificial intelligence uh, is a religion, right? And that's the title of one of my chapters, that there's this intense belief in it. And you see this type of belief across Silicon Valley. If you're going to build a company, you better believe in it, right? You better believe in what you're doing. Uh, and Silicon Valley in, in its own unique way, you know, really amplifies that dynamic. In this case, it's amplified even more, right? That you're believing in something that is so big, right? The idea we haven't talked about this, but the idea that you can build a machine that can do anything uh, the human brain can do, AGI, that's a huge idea. Um, and what was fascinating to me is that although many of these people um, are atheists, right, they don't believe in organized religion as you might think of it. They really believe in, in this, this idea in, in, in enormous ways. And that, that dynamic is super interesting to me. Absolutely. So they're engineering AGI or their God right. in a sense. Uh, yes. um, and yeah. And, and previously you mentioned uh, kind of the inconsistency between maybe what a company puts out publicly as a statement and actually what, what went on. And um, 
Not that I've ever <laughs> seen this happen before, but perhaps in light of recent events on ethics unfolding at Google, <laughs> what are your thoughts and opinions on that? And I know that the book touches on, you know, this interesting dynamic or this tension with, uh, of course, Project Maven, uh, but also how the DeepMind um, folks really thought about, you know, having that ethics board and that determining who to acquire them, you know, Facebook versus Google. But in light of the recent events on ethics now, uh, what what are some of your thoughts and opinions and uh, how do you see this? Uh, and you mentioned this a little bit, how history repeats itself, but how do you see this um, connecting with with the storyline? Yeah, you, you just brought up the, the military question, and that's one thing. The other thing that has really exploded just recently is the question of bias, right? The fact that so many of these systems, because of the way they are built, right? This is, and let's be clear on this, it's endemic to the technology. If you train on human data, that means you're going to bake human bias into the systems. We as humans are flawed. That means if you're going to train on our data, your system is going to be flawed. And there's this moment in the book where some r really interesting, you know, people working on a completely different side of this uh, come to the fore. And I'm talking about Timnit Gebru, uh, who was at Stanford at the time, uh, Meg Mitchell, who started at Microsoft and then came to Google and started this ethical AI team, um, Deb Raji, um, uh, Joy Bulamwini right, um, at, who was at MIT, and they start to alert the world to this, this problem that the systems are in many cases biased against women and, peop and people of color. In many cases, they, they generate toxic content. And again, you see a clash, right? You have this technology that really works in a lot of ways and becomes very important to these companies. And the companies are going to have certain motivations, right? It's important to their future. It's important to their bottom line. And they're going to want to get these technologies out. At the same time, uh, people like Tanit and Meg uh, and Joy and Deb are saying, hold on a second. We need to think about this. Uh, and there's this clash. And you see it in the book. In certain cases where Tim Neat and Meg are calling out companies about this and the companies respond in different ways. Some people say, you're right. We need to deal with this. Other people attack them. And you're seeing this play out again. Tim Neat and Meg um, are no longer at Google. Right. Um, this is this is a really big issue that is in the news right now. And. Um, it's such an important class. Like I can't, I can't tell you how important it is. And I don't think that, you know, although this has been written about a lot, everybody understands it, that there is this, this fundamental issue with the technology and there is no simple way to fix it. Right. It, you can't, it, there's this great, people may know the story, probably know the story. I know they do in the field about, this moment when uh, Google Photos uh, identified um, images um, uh, of a black person as a gorilla, right? And this should have been a big wake-up call for the industry. Um, there's there's this other character in the book. His name is um, uh, Jackie Alcine, and he's a he's a he's a software engineer himself. He lives in Brooklyn, and he's the one who saw this problem firsthand, it was his photos and he posted it to Twitter. And when I talked to him about this, he had this, it's a, just an incredible analogy, okay? He's a software engineer himself, he understands this. Basically what he says is, you know, a neural network, training neural network is like making lasagna, okay? If you make a mistake in your lasagna, there's no getting it out, right? It's all part of the same mix. So if you're training on this, on, on all the data that you need and the data is biased, you can't pick that out, right? And you can put a Band-Aid on it and you can do whatever else, um, but there's no easy way to fix that. And especially as our models get bigger and bigger, um, 
it becomes a bigger problem, right? Fundamentally, with these giant language models we're all now talking about, um, they work because they train on so much human, human data taken from the internet. And we all know that data on the internet is flawed. We all know there's toxicity on the internet and bias and so many other things. So how do you, how do you deal with that question, right? Do you really think Reddit is toxic? <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, this, this definitely explains uh, my lasagna a bit more. <laughs> but no, certainly, and this is a huge, huge issue. And I love that analogy. Um, and I, yeah, thinking about neural network as giant lasagna is actually quite concerning. <laughs> Uh, something very concerning because I don't think I could help that. Like that is what I like will admit right now. I don't think I could help this failing lasagna. Um, and I see that with, I mean, of course we see that with the large language models, as you mentioned now and how there are just no guardrails on it. So people are having very many issues trying to productize it because if there are no guardrails on it, what do you do? <laughs> what possible use cases can there be where you don't really hurt someone? Um, and I've seen some cases that might be promising, such as uh, I've seen how I think GPT-3 or one of the GPT variants is being used to help train uh, counselors, more mental health counselors, as like potential test cases. And so even if there aren't as many guardrails put in place. They have tried to put in some guardrails. Uh, even if you know something goes wrong there, it is still just a training program. And the person you're talking to as a counselor, uh, the, the fake person, which is GPT-3, would, you know, even if that, that person, quote unquote, would make some mistake, uh, it wouldn't be as damaging because it's actually just for training. And you almost expect that person to... to have some kind of problem with mental health anyways. And so uh, I think, you know, there are cases where this could be useful, but uh, it is much harder to see it go out live into the world and, and be a positive force for change. Right. Um, um, I, th I think yeah. that's well said, right? With all these technologies, it's complicated, right? We, in, in the military field, they call them dual use technologies, right? You can have one use that is completely positive, and then you can have another use where it is far from positive, and it's the same technology, right? Um, you know, we have to think about the technologies the way we think about the world. Like we, as humans, we, we like to think in absolutes and that things are either A or B. Well, things are more complicated than that, and, and we need to recognize that. We need to think about uh, our whole world differently. And that includes the technology we're building. Right. And I think we've seen this with technology everywhere, right? Like dynamite was used to, hey, maybe we can mine things more easily. Well, also there's this bomb thing that we could do with them. And, uh, or genetics, we saw, we've also seen it. And so I wonder if, you know, I think there will be some regulatory forces at play uh, in the near future uh, with this type of thing. Um, something that really struck me actually with the book is given the direction of this AGI obsession, religion, perhaps, uh, I was actually really surprised to hear that DeepMind had that uh, sense of ethics from the beginning. That sounds really bad, but I, I really didn't think they had a constraint on that. And I really didn't think they cared about that um, given their marketing now. And so uh, I think it was very useful to have that in the book because I, I didn't even think that they cared about that. Um, and so knowing that they care about it and still seeing where things are at is kind of <laughs> concerning. <laughs> um, uh, so <laughs> Like, oh, shoot, <laughs> um, this constraint optimization problem didn't quite work out as planned. Uh, so yeah, you're right. That's interesting yeah. that you you think about it like that, because they really do care about it. And they cared about it in the moment when they were being acquired. I've talked to not just the founders of DeepMind about this. I've talked to other people who were there. Right. And that was a big issue when they're selling to Google that they wanted these constraints. The other thing I know, because um, I have so much reporting about this, is when the Project Maven thing came up at Google, 
Uh, and that's when Google started to work with the DOD and there was all this concern at Google. The DeepMind folks were really upset about that. The founders of DeepMind were really upset about that, right? They did have this, this clause in their contract that, that said their technology could not be used for the military. Um, and this is another part of Google that's working with the DOD, but they, but they were not happy about that. And there was a big struggle inside that company uh, about this. And, you know, a lot of people have left the company since, um, you know, a lot of people uh, who raised, raised, you know, the alarm about this. Um, uh but you know th- those struggles aren't going away, right? You have people inside um, a lot of these companies on on each side of these issues that we're talking about, and there's just a lot of a lot of disagreement and a lot of conflict. You do wonder how a lot of these things are going to play out. Right, absolutely, and we see also researchers leaving the field. For example, PJ Reddy, a uh, Joseph Redman, um, who made YOLO one of the top detection models, at least in efficiency and speed, uh, leave computer vision entirely, publicly leaving, uh, because he thinks, you know, I don't see my technology being applied to anything good, even though it could be. Uh, And so, yeah, we're definitely seeing that too. And there's more, I think it's just more in the air, more and more now. Um, And it's like a... I think it's actually good that people are thinking about it a bit more and perhaps there will be some kind of more Hippocratic oath like thing uh, that engineers, ML engineers will sign and think about a little bit more in their work. Um, And the last thing I want to touch on is around women and of course people of color featured in your book. Um, I felt like uh, there were a lot of women, I guess in the book who are uh, on kind of more of the ethics side. Um, and then there's definitely Fei Fei Li. Um, but I'm just curious uh, how you decided to feature these people. I felt like Fei Fei didn't actually get as much attention. Maybe it's just because I'm at Stanford and she gets like a ton of attention <laughs> here. Um, but I felt like she wasn't as featured. Maybe she wasn't as early as some of the other folks. Uh, I'm just curious about kind of what the decision making was there for those. Yeah, things. I think there are a couple of people that think about and talk about and a couple of ideas I think about. Like one person you didn't mention is Sarah Sabor, um, you know, who whose story is interesting, who works with Jeff Hinton um, at Google now, um, uh, an Iranian immigrant who couldn't get a visa uh, in the U.S. And it sort of plays into these geopolitical tensions. Um, she's another figure in the book. Fei Fei Lee is a great one uh, to bring up um, because – like in a way, she's a she's she and her work are a little bit tangential to what I'm covering, right? My, my the central thread of my book is this neural network idea and how that's going to change things. But in a way, Fei Fei's story mirrors Jeff Hinton's story, and I've been talking a lot about this recently. In that, the reason that neural networks finally started to work after decades is that we had two things: we had the processing power we needed, and we had the data, right? And that's why it never worked, because you didn't have those two things. And Feifei was instrumental in providing the data, uh, particularly and, you know, pointedly for the AlexNet result, right? AlexNet won the ImageNet contest, and it was Feifei um, and, and collaborators who built that contest and built, the, more importantly, the data set that was needed um, to show that a neural network could do image recognition in that way. And there, you know, there's this interesting moment when, when she is trying to decide what she's going to bank her career on and she wants to build ImageNet and her advisor um, said, you shouldn't do that. That's a bad idea. You shouldn't, you shouldn't bet your career on this. And she did it anyway. Right. Um, again, at least in spirit, is mirroring uh, Jeff Hinton and and others in this book. Um, You know, she comes up later in that chapter about Google and Project Maven. And, you know, I think she and others might see it differently. But what that that's really about is someone getting caught up in that dynamic that we talked about earlier, where you've got people on one side and you've got companies on another, right? 
and people and their aims and their careers get caught up in this thing that is larger than them. Um, and that has happened to a lot of people, right? And some people uh, resolve, like you pointed out, to leave the field. Um, some people resolve to leave companies um, and go back to universities. Um, there are all different ways of dealing with this. Um, and and uh, people see the situations differently and they deal with it differently. Uh, but one of the things I'm fascinated by is that so many of these situations uh, are about point of view. And I think Project Maven is a great example, right? There are people who were at Google who thought that Project Maven was the worst thing that could happen, that Google would work with the DOD. There were other people who thought that absolutely had to happen for national security reasons, right? And a lot of these things are about, about perspective. And um, if, if you're a reporter at the New York Times or it you know, as the author of this book, my aim is not to take sides. My aim is to document what has happened and show people um, what they need to know about their world. And part of that is showing it from all different sides. Um, and, you know, to get back around to the, the nut of your original question, um, part of that is to show that and the, the book, you know, in, in its sweep shows this, that so many of the people working in the field were white men, right? And that's why the bias thing is a problem. And there are specific moments in the book where people see this, right? It's about choosing the data, right? There are all sorts of other issues um, uh, to think about when it comes to bias and toxicity, but one of the issues is choosing the data. And if you're, if you're, Again, it's, it's relative, right? If you are a white man, you're going to have a certain view of the world and you're going to have a certain view of, of data. Um, you're going to have a certain view of, of, of what should be included in, and what's not. And sometimes that's a conscious thing. Sometimes it's unconscious. And so that it was important for me to sort of show that and, um, and, and say it from the beginning, right? There's a moment in the prologue where, you know, where I point out that, you know, a lot of these people uh, are white men. Uh, that's just what happened. And there are consequences to that. Right. And uh, and I think sometimes it's just because it's two weeks before the deadline and you're scraping images and uh, off the web and you happen to be scraping it based off a of Google search. But that Google search algorithm is also maybe a little bit biased or toward, it, it's tuned for something in particular. And so that's what happens. I think a lot of what I've seen is unconscious bias um, being there. I don't see why someone would intentionally do something very malicious. Uh, and I don't, I don't see that happening the, in the research community, but because using the models that we are using now, kind of the uh, ability to optimize so strongly for the data that we have uh, has, you know, heightened the biases much more and made them surface up and be, much more impactful uh, and, and much more of just a relevant thing as opposed to like, oh, we messed up some little thing or we, d we did the shortest shortcut ever here and uh, got it working. Um, yeah, that's often what's happening. And so to one of your points uh, around Feifei and Jeffrey Hinton going against their advisors, I hope I will be able to quote you on that one. I'd have to answer <laughs> next. <laughs> um, uh, we shall see how that goes. I know we didn't talk too much about Andrew. He, uh, I believe he was uh, um, characterized accurately uh, in I the like, book. <laughs> I like Andrew a lot. And uh, he's an interesting thread in this, this story. And in part because he's another person that kind of, you know, bridges um, – the, the world between the U.S. and China. And I think that, that is another fascinating thread. We talked a little about this, but that just, you know, keeps going in the book. And then, of course, it keeps going here in the real world, you know, as we speak. Right. And I think that this is another issue where it's very easy to say, 
you know, things are divided between A and B. And, and really, it's more complicated than that. And, um, and like with a lot of the things we've been discussing, people need to think about, you know, geopolitics and um, immigration and tariffs in different ways, right? This is not, you know, this is not an easy world, say, of the 1950s, where we would think of morality and politics um, in these simple ways. It's, it's far more complicated. And I think that, um, you know, Andrew is just part of that story, right? Because he went to work for Google and then he went to work for, for Baidu. And we, we talked about Chi Lu, who, who winds up at Baidu as well. And I think the situation in China is not only more interesting than people think, um, but it's more complicated and enormously important. Like, I can't believe how many of these things we're talking about, like, um, are so important to our, our futures, right? Right. And it also impacts the whole uh, defense aspect, too. It makes us think about that more, right? And uh, and I think on the China side, I, I think the AI index just found that uh, China officially, I think this year, uh, has exceeded in publications and citations on AI, exceeded the U.S. Um, and so they're beating us on that front, quote unquote. And I think that's kind of a telling sign of where things are going um, and how this is, you know, this race isn't over, but we are head to head um, and they, they're a little bit ahead now. And I think we always thought of them as trailing behind and following, but it doesn't seem like that actually is the case from the book, for sure, <laughs> from the beginning. And and now um, I think feeling it a little bit more. I, you're you're exactly right. The, the one thing I would add to that, though, is that um, everything you said is true. The other thing that I think people miss is that the United States relies on foreign talent, period, mm, yes. right? So it's so easy to say, OK, we're we're uh, we're worried about what our rivals are going to do. So we're going to shut down our borders like that. That just ends up shooting yourself um, in the foot. Right. Um, and that that that's another point, And it shows you how complicated this stuff is, is that um, immigrant talent is vital to the U.S. And you want to make sure that continues to flow. And, and of course, we also have to worry about, you know, foreign espionage and, and that kind of thing. Um, but you, again, you can't think in absolutes mm -hmm. and you have to realize um, that, uh, that immigrants are an important part of the company, country writ large, but also certainly in this field, right? Um, uh, that, that so much of the talent, we started the conversation like this, so much of the talent was not inside our borders. It was outside. Yeah, absolutely. Especially e even the key key players are nearly all of them are just outs from outside uh, of the U.S. Yes. Um, yeah. So that is definitely something to keep in mind. Well, with that, thank you so much for joining me uh, today, Kate. This was really fun, illuminating and very thoughtful. Thank you for all your comments too. No, it was great. And you have a great sense of humor yourself. I, I you know, I think your your pointed sarcasm that like really added to the conversation. It's been fun. I'm just trying to make myself a potential candidate for the right next on. book. That's all I'm trying to do. Right <laughs> um, all right, I will do a quick closing statement and then we can right. close up. Uh, so Thank you so much for listening to this special interview episode of Skynet Today's Let's Talk AI podcast. Please leave a review and subscribe to us if you like the show.